we're going to get started right away in small group and go forward from there in preparation for the small group. I just wanted to take a moment to uh, have our presenters say hello to you. Uh, we have three amazing presenters connected with the Trust Network. Uh, I'm just going to go from how they are in the slide. Madhava, would you like to welcome our guest? Hi, welcome. My name is Madhava Mads Palihapiche. You can call me Mads. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Trust Network and an expert on conflict early warning, early response. Um, and we are glad to have you and uh, to have an opportunity to engage you on this broad issue of early warning and the Trust Network. Thank you, Marwa. Following Marwa, we have Prabha. Prabha, would you like to say hello to our guests? You'll need to unmute. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome. Delighted that you could join us. My name is Prabha Shankar Narayan. I am with Mediators Beyond Borders and one of the co-conveners of the Trust Network. Thank you, Prabha. And Ben has put a request in the chat to please put your name and location and any affiliation um, you have as you sit in our circle today. So we all have a better sense of who who is present in this process. And let me now introduce our third speaker, and that's Brendan. Brendan, would you care to say hello to our guests? Hello, and, and welcome to everybody uh, from Scotland, actually. Uh, everybody else is based in the US. Um, I lead up uh, Per USA, that's Political Incident Reporting USA, which is a media monitoring and early warning uh, project, I suppose, at the moment, um, which has been uh, one of the sort of founding members and now a partner of the Trust Network, and we'll be talking about media monitoring and early warning later on today. <clears throat> Well, very good. Actually, we're going to get started asking uh, you and Marwa to please walk us through the hypothetical before we go into our, our breakout room. The hypothetical will also be placed in your breakout room as well. And the two questions that we want you to think about in the breakout room is what is, what is the data telling you? What's your assessment of the community as the fact pattern goes? And what would you do with the data? How, how would you find more? What, what action would you suggest taking? Uh, you'll have about 15 minutes for this conversation, and then we'll ask you to report out that experience. And then we will move you through the development of the Trust Network and the early warning, early response system. So Marwa, Brendan? Great. Um, so some of you, or most of you, hopefully, I don't know, uh, might be familiar with the concept of conflict early warning early response doesn't matter what your level of familiarity with it uh, what we're going to do is jump quickly into an actual scenario um, it's a hypothetical scenario but um, not unlike what we've been seeing uh, in the trust network uh, on a regular basis in some of our large uh, cities and towns uh, so we'll um, introduce this to you in the chat um, the the scenario and uh, what we'll do is we'll go into small groups to review sort of the fact pattern which is um, what really is going on here um, is there something that uh, you can do to respond uh, what sort of um, assets uh, or points of leverage can you find in this scenario for you to uh, both collect useful information about uh, what's going on to verify that information, but also to, if, if possible, intervene and mobilize, uh, because this could be uh, something that could happen in your community. So with that, we'll go into groups, and then we, when we come back, um, we'll kind of debrief, and we'll use this um, case as, a, as a, a jumping point into the world of conflict, early warning, and early response. and, and uh, uh, to the trust network and how you can get involved in that. Sounds good? All right. Yes. So with that, uh, Brendan, if you want to, someone can put the these folks in groups.
Well, hello, everyone. So I'm going to be filtering all of you into uh, a room of about five other participants to chat on this piece, who will then bring you back to the main room and dive deeper into what you've learned and more about the early warning, early response system. So this is a chance to meet your fellow participants, but also discuss uh, what has been brought up thus far. OK, I will filter you automatically. Give me two seconds. Welcome back. We had a wonderful conversation in our room. Uh, very exciting. And we got we didn't see that the time was ending. Uh, so I think we're in the middle of some amazing thoughts about digging deeper into our subconscious. So I just want to thank those participants that were in the small group. I had the pleasure of holding space for. Great job, everyone. And so with that, I think if we can start the slides again, I'm going to turn this over to my friend Prabha. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, so we also, and I didn't do a very good job because I didn't see the time ending. And one of the participants was in the middle of what he was going to do. So we clearly have a, a group of people who are doing a lot of amazing work in their communities. So what is an early warning, early response system? What we wanted to do today is have the opportunity to share with you the short history and development of the first conflict early warning, early response platform in the United States. In October 2020, as we all watched the events in this country unfold and learned about what was necessary, um, several of us came together to take the opportunity to transform what we saw as the momentum of increasing polarization and division into the possibility of creating an early warning platform in this country. And so identifying that we needed a very coordinated approach because there are many sectors that work somewhat independently and um, recognizing that there is wisdom, knowledge and expertise at the local level in communities across this country as well as in the interventions that have been designed in countries around the world that have highly sophisticated conflict early warning pl platforms. We decided to form this, the Trust Network, which was basically targeted for information gathering um, through local convening centers with the partnership of national international partners and members. Um, and what I will say uh, very quickly, which you'll hear a lot more from my colleagues, is uh, my, my simple response that I learned, um, what is an early warning, early response system? It is a system that provides the right information to the right people at the right time for the right action. And I have used it in a lot of different places as the simplest way of describing what can be a fairly complicated system. And so this came up um, as we convened. You hear, you see all of the conveners. Per USA was an original convener and remains a part of this platform. And we are fortunate now to have Madhva from the Center for Peacebuilding, Democracy and Development at UMass, along with the National Association for Community Mediation and DG, who is facilitating this session, uh, brings with him the work that he has done with the centers, with over the 300 centers across the country, as we form this national civic infrastructure. And, and I will say that this is really important to look at braiding together peace building, social justice and democracy organizations because there are ways in which we work somewhat separately. Um, the peace building organizations do a lot of the work at the mapping analysis and building social cohesion and designing and intervening as needed. The racial and social justice organizations work at the local and the national level, as you all know, and the structural reform people, which is what we are including in the democracy and um, governance or sector is what we are bringing together collectively in order to transform this moment of possibility in this country 
of real possibility. One of the members in my group talked about doing a peace analysis, and I was delighted to hear that because so often we hear of a conflict analysis, but not necessarily one that's complemented by a peace and resilience analysis also. Um, this, this particular image I wanted to mention is an adaptation of Veronique Dudé's work in which she talks about conflict transformation happening at the intersection of peace building and civil resistance. Uh, what we have learned over the last few years and particularly in the last two years of coming together as a network is that there are some unique factors in this context in the United States. One of them is the very robust, whoops, I'm sorry, judiciary, the legal community. Um, there are networks, for example, I live in Pittsburgh and in Pennsylvania around the, the issues of political violence and or community violence. There is a very strong network of legal actors like the ACLU, like pro bono attorneys who are all deeply connected and trust each other to respond as needed. What we also had, I will say, um, is, it, is a judiciary that we could rely upon to respond as needed. And I say that in the past tense and I will let others comment on it because that's shifting. It's clearly shifting. And the fourth one is the structural reform actors, the democracy and governance actors. And it is in this space that I think where all of these sectors come together that the possibility for transforming this moment exists. The members of the network, um, clearly all of us identify as working across any kind of divide. Uh, including and particularly the political divide. And the way it works is that there is a core group um, with decades of experience in these areas that has come together with um, those with expertise in countering radicalization, those with expertise in media and messaging, mediation and restorative practices, truth and transformation practices, and violence interruption. And so these are the members, and we are obviously looking to expand this membership. And I'm going to start. Raba, point. If, yes, if sir. You go to the slide, the one above this one. I, I do want to highlight before we yeah. move into our early warning. Please. Uh, Hassan put in the chat. I think what's a key point is to understand who are, who are from the local level could collaborate ah. with the national level. And you're absolutely right. That is the unique dynamic that the trust network has added through uh, Proverbs design is not only is it the national folks that are all these categories you see in that diagram uh, having NAFCOM having other national partners who have community organizations as well is to make sure we are working with listening to and being reject redirected by the local communities there have been times when we were doing this last year where the data indicated X and then we met with the local community and clearly at least multiple times was told that's not the issue here, here's the issue. And so even knowing from that local community what we need to look for, what are our assumptions we make nationally that are really incorrect for certain communities. And so you're absolutely right, I want to underscore that. And so all these groups you see we look for nationally, we're also looking for locally. And we're continuing to, so I'm gonna do a pre-plug, please think of become part of the Trust Network. If you have national groups or local groups that are doing any of this work, because that combination is so essential. Thank you, Prabha, for letting me add that. Yeah, oh, that's great. Please, let's keep this somewhat informal. We are a small group, so we can do that. Um, here are, as you can see, the American Friends Service Committee, the Bridge Alliance, uh, all of the partners who also have local actors, uh, the Listen First Project, the coalition of about 300. Each of these groups comes with members in the tens and sometimes in the hundreds. So I will stop there at this point, having just introduced what we created um, together collectively through the commitment of amazing people who stepped into the space 
couple of years ago and turn it over to my colleagues to describe the platform itself. Uh, just a quick wrap up uh, of what I heard and uh, the presentations by Prabha and DG uh, before we get into uh, and, and Brendan is going to take over pretty soon. Um, uh, we had um, discussions around root causes in the in the conversations. We heard discussions around uh, preventing um, cycles, you know, of violence. So it's important in our evalu uh, in our early warning approach to focus on uh, structural violence, um, you know, issues issues around marginalization, uh, racial uh, segregation, poverty. A lot of these sort of root causes or what we call structural violence uh, as well as sort of the operational uh, uh, early warning which focuses on direct violence uh, attacks uh, arson uh, things like that so in our approach are combining both the operational uh, prevention and the structural prevention um, the the interconnectedness between the two is that if you don't pay attention to structural prevention, you're going to have continuous cycles of violence, you know, whichever country we are talking about. If you don't address operational violence or direct violence, you're not going to be able to focus on the structural conditions because you're constantly firefighting. Uh, so um, so uh, let's keep that in mind. And what we are trying to do through the trust network uh, is to build those communities who will monitor the situation on the ground, share information, but also be willing to act uh, because the fundamental idea behind our work is that we do not want violence in our backyard. We want uh, safe, peaceful communities. Uh, we want to, to safeguard democracy. We want to safeguard our democratic elections, institutions of democracy, rule of law, etc. So these are some of the, the operational and some of the structural uh, uh ideas behind this early warning system and we are collecting data as you see from this map which is something that uh, we've developed at umass boston to systematically analyze events data uh, and to look at spatial data geospatial data um, and to link up early, early warnings with early responses um we go on to the next slide so uh, I'm going to hand over to Brendan to discuss uh, the social media side of it. Uh, Brendan. Uh, thanks, Madhava. Uh, so this is uh, meant to be a, a little bit of an introduction to the, the media monitoring work that we do, which is uh, intended to feed in to the early warning part of, of the whole system and, and therefore also with the network that we are helping to provide remotely uh, information to partners that are on the ground in cities and communities right across the US. Um, a very quick, um, perhaps step back in time before that, uh, to give a little bit of context and considering that, you know, we have quite an international uh, audience and, you know, participant group here. Um, and it was nice actually just in that break, breakout group there to have uh, Kevin from Malindi in Kenya, and also Ted Perlmutter, who I worked with um, nine years ago, I think it is now. And, you know, one of the things that informed how we designed the system for, for monitoring and early warning in the US was very much based on the, the Kenyan model, and to some extent also uh, taking some lessons from some of the work that's been done by code in Nigeria. So again, election monitoring was where we started. Um, and in fact, what we now call uh, per USA political incident reporting USA started off as election incident reporting because the project started initially, of course, because of the, the presidential and congressional elections in November 2020. Um, but one of the things that I think uh, certainly motivated me with how we designed this system was whereas a lot of the systems that you know we had in the early days of, of crisis mapping and using using ushahidi which of course is a you know kenyan design system um were based on crowdsourcing ideals and, and and models 
we felt that for America, which is a very media rich system, if you like, so there's a um, very rich supply, particularly in, in developed urban areas of information, and that actually it is probably more efficient where you have that kind of dense and granular coverage um, by both the traditional media and other kinds of media that actually, if you can design a system to try and harvest as efficiently as possible the information that's coming out while events are happening, that you may um, have a better overview uh, and an up-to-date coverage of, of what exactly is happening on the ground, even if you're, you know, thousands of miles away, uh, as I literally am uh, in Scotland. So, yeah, um, the main vehicle into this so the main sort of way we we get into the information that's emerging from events is by using twitter and so with um what the per usa twitter account i and my colleagues and, and volunteers we've put together lists for pretty much every state in the us uh, and for some of the cities where you get quite a lot happening such as minneapolis and dc etc then at uh, dedicated lists to include as many journalists and also independent videographers and sometimes local activists as we possibly can. Um, and yeah, just a quick couple comments there that, you know, when we started off, I didn't include the kind of journalists who covered education because education wasn't an obvious flashpoint, but it is these days as, as anybody who's, you know, following current affairs in the US that school boards are one of the front lines of, you know, both the cultural and political uh, debates um, or even clashes that we have in the US today. Okay, um, next, um, whoever is doing slides, is that you, Prabha? Um, yeah, so, um, and with the information that, you know, we gather as as things are happening, and now sometimes we have warning that there's going to be a big event. So, for example, um, yes, we knew that something fairly big, we didn't know that uh, the capital was going to be stormed, on January the 6th, but we certainly expected that something big was going to happen and that there was a real risk of violence. And so, you know, you can be prepared for that. You can have your volunteers uh, lined up. Um, you can have all of your lists ready. You know which journalists in particular maybe to keep an eye on, um, particularly some of the, the live streamers, for example. But at other times, we just keep a watching brief, uh, particularly at weekends, because that's often when things happen. Uh, and, you know, Friday and Saturday nights, not surprisingly, are some of the busiest nights um, when you'll see events or Saturday afternoons, sometimes Sunday afternoons. And you, uh, you know, you look for, for patterns. So, for example, things go up and down. After January the 6th, there was a lull in political violence for a few months on the whole. It's not that nothing was happening, but uh, there was a change in pattern. And that's where we started to see some of this stuff with school boards and also where some of the violence or some of the the contentious activity, perhaps, which of course can be a precursor to violence, um, was happening where the flashpoints were about COVID-related issues. So masking mandates, vaccination mandates, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, next. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, and again, I won't go through this in any detail, but, you know, we do have criteria as to what exactly it is we're taking an interest in and, and, and what not. Um, sometimes it can be a bit of a fine line. I mean, again, you know, without harping on and on about school boards, it really is something that we wouldn't have paid any attention to probably a year and a half ago, two years ago, but now it absolutely is. But interestingly, and this is where the, the combination of good, remote monitoring, you know, as professional as possible, media monitoring, you know, by monitors who understand the media eco ecosystem and, and generally the political trends, combined with monitoring from volunteers and members of partner organizations is so crucial because a lot of what's happening with school boards actually doesn't come into the media immediately. It's something that will emerge maybe a couple of days later, you know, if it's in some rural county where uh, these days, so often media coverage is is sadly lacking, and of course, this is one of the big issues that uh, you know America is contending with at the moment in terms of democracy and information. And uh, you know, there's so much that we can do remotely, but actually, at the end of the day, um, without having information coming from communities themselves, um, we're still going to be pretty blind. 
And yeah, uh, as I think, I think on the whole, yeah. the the definitions there um, speak largely for themselves. So finally, um, just very quickly, maybe try and illustrate where we can maybe more intensively uh, provide a kind of early warning support. So a lot of the time we're feeding information to the network and so the partner organizations, the volunteer members, um, the you know members of uh, NAFCOM community mediation centers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, uh, and that tends not to be necessarily entirely immediate. We're often reporting on stuff that, that's happened or, you know, that it doesn't have to be real time, but where you actually have partners or members of partner organizations, actual active de-escalators and peace builders who are actually out there where violence can happen, where there's a real risk of violence happening, then there is very much a premium on making sure that uh, you can do your job as, as uh effectively and as quickly as possible the map probably um yeah doesn't, doesn't worry too much perhaps about but basically you're looking at um those of you who know dc will recognize it fairly quickly um the sort of green area there to the left is is the white house and lafayette square just um to the north of it and then you've got um, blm plaza immediately um above that and mcpherson square small square just to the northeast of BLM Plaza. You've also got the Capitol Hilton. And then uh, if you come down to the bottom, you can see Freedom Plaza and then further over uh, to the east, Harry's Bar at the Harrington Hotel. So this is really talking about the the big event, which was kind of in many way the the practice event as it turned out for the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and various other people who were taking to some extent the lead on January the 6th, um, where there was a, a huge gathering and the peacekeepers that we were working with uh, that was the dc peace team and they were based mostly at blm plaza so the help that they needed from us was to be aware of any threats or any movements of people who could cause violence either to them or to the people they were associated with or just to the general public so what, what I and, and others in the remote support team were doing was intensively scanning through particularly live stream and other up to the minute photographic reports that were coming through on Twitter, but sometimes also on Facebook Live and Instagram and, and uh, Twitch and so on um, to see where exactly the, the more dangerous groups were. So, for example, when a group uh, was at Freedom Plaza and they started moving up to the north and heading towards as they did McPherson Square and, and then the Hilton and K Street, then we needed to, through Signal, because Signal is much more immediate than Slack, get the information to them. And basically it was, you know, right, there's 50 Proud Boys, they're moving north, they're moving quickly. Um, this is the intersection they've last been seen at and they're carrying, you know, if they're carrying any kind of weapons, uh, and also, you know, we would report where there were uh, perhaps activists, where there were police barricades, et cetera, et cetera. So in this sort of case, you really do have to um, keep very much on top of things and you need uh, a rich supply of information to be able to do that. But of course, again, it works best when it's combined with people who are on the ground who can also do some scouting peripherally. So for example, we had somebody, I think in the Hilton, who was up on whatever the you know, fourth floor, who was reporting from their window and what was happening in the street below. And that was also extremely important. Okay, I think that's been um, hopefully kind of a general introduction to um, what we do with Pretty USA and media monitoring. And I'll hand you back to Madhava, if that's okay. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the five... Um, uh, ideas around uh, the early warning system, uh, just to recap what Prabha said, is providing the right information to the right stakeholders in the right format uh, for the right action. Um, you know, this sounds very simple, but it's not, not that easy um, because there is obviously a lot of information out there on social media, you know, a lot of uh, information on the ground in terms of rumors. So how do we sift through all this information? Uh, and one of the things that we invite you to think about is um, what can you do? Um, uh, you know, how, how can you partner with the trust network 
because the biggest um, gap uh, with any early warning system is the warning to response gap. Uh, and we've seen uh, international examples of this, you know, in Rwanda, you know, all over the world. There is always information, some information, even in, in the January 6th attack, there was a lot of information about the intention of these groups, of these individuals online. So anyone who was looking at it would have been able to predict some of these things. But what happens in response? Uh, that isn't always the task of law enforcement or the FBI or whoever. A lot of this has to do with uh, social cohesion, uh, finding common ground with other citizens who might be uh, looking at things differently uh, and, and, and um, getting together under the banner of uh, addressing violence. Uh, because violence is very disrupt disruptive. And as we learned on January 6th, our democracy can be fragile, uh, more fragile than we think. So what we are trying to do is to build from the bottom up, um, not just early warning, early response capacity, uh, but engagement and involvement uh, and empowerment of local groups, uh, individuals like you, uh, community members, uh, church groups, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and to be ready next time we identify these cycles of violence emerging uh, to try and um, put out those flames and and not by you know going either with you know oh, this is going to be sort of a uh, liberal uh, you know group that's trying to intervene no we want to find the common ground because there are lots of people on both sides who do not want violence uh, we believe that so we are trying to reach out to these groups and uh, probably will explain to you a lot more about that uh, idea but uh, the early warning system, uh, we're looking to you to strengthen through these networks um, and by adding all kinds of other uh, uh, activities, including some trainings. So we invite you to come for those early warning trainings as well in the uh, as part of the trust network. Thanks. Thank you very much for a very quick and helpful introduction to both the development of the trust network, the composition of the trust network, and critically, that conversation that happens locally, gets fed up, that Madhu and Brennan both talked about, and then gets put back out both across to the other national partners and down to our community context as well. So that we're constantly giving and feeding information both ways so we can be clear where does there appear to be violence occurring or maybe will be occurring. What can we do to help de-escalate that, work with that? As Madhura said, it doesn't matter for the majority of people how you see the world. Most people want a peaceful street and a safe home and a safe neighborhood. And so with that, we're going to break into our groups again. The two questions are, now that you know a little bit more about the Trust Network, how could you or what would you ask them to do to help in this situation? What information would you want them to know that you think would be critical? What would you want to know? And how can you enhance what you bring? How? What are your suggestions for enhancing the trust network as well? So we have 15 minutes for that conversation. Then we'll come back and let's hear from each other. DG, before people go, can I just ask that um, I didn't do a very good job in my group of asking people to self-facilitate since we were there. Uh, just reminding people, you're all facilitators also. So when you go back, please do so. You have the questions Ben has posted in the chat. Thank you. Excellent. I'm going to uh, filter you off to some smaller rooms to have more intimate conversations on these two topics. Um, I'll see you back in 15 minutes, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Would love to hear a little bit from each of the four groups if people would like to. I could always select a name of someone who's in my group, but that would be a little unfair. So uh, I don't know uh, who is in the circle with Prabha or Marwa or Brendan, who would like to, to share a takeaway that, that you can read. And I'm assuming you can unmute yourself here. I don't know that to be so. This is not a system I've used before. 
Yeah. Can we see everyone else? There were questions that came up. Festus had a couple of questions that I thought would be helpful for us to bring back to plenary, if that's all right. Fantastic. Uh, it was a very rich discussion. Um, one, uh, and I think Amira also raised the question from a previous session about um, the, the amount of misinformation that is being spread. And um, I thought the example of the local convening centers being able to verify the facts was a key function that the trust network has been able to do and can continue to do. Um, if you want to add anything more about that, DG, uh, and then I'll go on to the other two. No, other than that came up, two of our different speakers, both from Sudan and from Nigeria, both stated the importance of giving time to the local groups to talk amongst themselves and figure and that's been our design where the centers that we're working with are not there to do the work they're there to bring folks into the circle and have everyone talk about who sees themselves best in what role and what responsibility in the community so i heard a lot of affirmation from our uh, brothers in africa so that was absolutely wonderful for me so the second was about the possibility of unident unidentified reporters, given that sometimes people in the community uh, might be putting themselves at risk if they are reporting. How is this system taking that into account? Um, and I, I don't know, Madhva, if you wanted to speak to that, both from your experience and what we've done to screen and create the list here at Trust. Yeah, something similar came up in uh, my group as well. Um, and I kind of played a devil's advocate a little and uh, and uh, asked them, you know, what, what is it that we are doing? And I post this to you as well. Are we monitoring the activities of violent groups? Um, you know, are we spying? Um, why are we doing this, right? Uh, and connected therewith is your answer to the question, how do we solve the, the uh, security issue? So we are uh, humanitarian groups. We are individuals with a common purpose, which uh, has to do with, uh, which, is, which has a humanitarian purpose. We uh, are not collect, connected politically or motivated uh, for political reasons or for military reasons. A lot of you who are working internationally will identify with this. Uh, people push will push you back on, on what you're doing, why you're collecting, collecting information, where the information goes, who looks at this information. So um, making sure that you explain who you are and what you're doing uh, straight off the bat is one good way to um, avoid trouble further down the road. So you are members of the community, your legitimacy, there was an issue, a question around power that was raised in my group. So I'll uh, make it an opportunity to talk about that as well. So who are we? You know, what sort of power do we have to intervene in this? I mean, we are just uh, civilians. Uh, you have police forces, you have, you know, um, SWAT teams, you have the FBI, you have all, you know, all of these heavily funded organizations as opposed to maintain peace and in all of that who are we what power do we have well you know i don't want to get into too much of this but we have democratic power uh and if you want to go back to the philosophy of it you know jojen habermas talked about uh, communicative power uh that's real power uh it's not uh, what we call hard power it's soft power you know one of our group members actually touched on that which was great so we are powerful uh, just not in sort of the conventional, tr traditional way. Um, so, you know, one of the ways to make sure that you don't put yourself in harm's way is to be extremely clear who you are uh, and what you bring to the table. You are not powerless, uh, especially when you are in a group. And that's the reason behind creating this uh, network, which is based on trust. The trust, trust network was built on those foundations so that you are not acting on your own. You're not alone. Um, Madam, if I may, just yes. I want to underscore that our sister Samantha in our group highlighted that what people need to is to disempower themselves. They already know what they can do. They are connected. 
they need to hear from others, you can do this. And, and that that is, you're absolutely right. That's an important thing the Trust Network is doing. So I just wanted to underscore what happened in your group also happened in mine with the exact same thoughts is that we have to really encourage people to seize the power they do have so that they can create the community that they desire. So thank you for letting me, jump. I just was hearing you and wanted to make sure you, you knew what our sister Samantha had said. Sure. So uh, another way to look at uh, safety uh, is operational at the operational level. You don't want to rush in to do uh, interventions if you don't, one, have the skills. Uh, number two, if the situation is dangerous. Um, if you know that there are uh, groups out there who are tactically, uh, 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 who have a tactical advantage over you, who have uh, uh, weapons, you do not want to rush into that uh, environment. So there are operational things that you need to keep in mind when it comes to safety. Um, you know, your identity, uh, the power you bring to the table, operational safety and security, safety in numbers belonging to a critical mass of individuals, which, which is what the trust network is trying to build. Uh, and if you join the trust network, not if, when you join the trust network, we will systematically train you uh, into thinking in, in a more, much more deeper into each of these uh, uh, aspects of uh, security, uh, your identity, your the power that you bring to the table, um, the the ways that you can intervene, the ways that you can monitor safely uh, and bring about change. Are there any closing thoughts? We have about four minutes left. And uh, Pravin and Brennan, we well definitely Brennan, we haven't heard from your group that you are in any. Any additional reflections from your group, and then we'll close out with Prabha. Um, for um, Hassan, do you have any um, things, quick, quick lesson you maybe could take from our group to share with the group, the wider group? Who is uh, people? Are non moderators allowed to talk? Maybe they're not. They can unmute themselves, I think. Hassan, is it Hassan Edi? Edi? Hassan Emma. <laughs> in spite of time, Brennan, can you share what? Yeah, you think I, indeed. I mean, I mean, we we, we yeah. talked a little bit about how difficult it can be to set up networks on the ground, really. You know, to and mm. and how you go about doing that. Um, you look at, you know, what sort of organisations there are, whether the faith-based groups are strong, or whether it's community sort of social active groups, etc. Um, and you try and you know work with those and build relationships, and it, it you know it, it's difficult. Um, it's difficult whether it's in uh, here's Hassan. <clears throat> well, yeah, we're probably a bit out of time actually, unfortunately. But um, no, really, again, valued the opportunity to share and uh, compare between the U.S. and, and countries like um, Iraq and also Kenya, etc. <clears throat> And if there aren't any others, DG, in the two minutes, um, let's. I want to thank all of you who came here to yes. share our expertise. I want to begin by thanking um, every leader of every organization and network that you saw listed. Mm -hmm. We came forward, and I would say if we were doing a peace analysis, a resilience analysis, these leaders of these networks and peace building organizations I can't name all of them, so I'm not going to start. I'm going to ask you to go look at them. Stepped into that space, and I would say contribute to this day and continue to, to the peace building capacity in this country. And do we need it? Yes, we do. Did this start with a lot of wisdom from countries like Kenya? Yes. Um, Alice Enderitu, who's the Deputy Secretary for Genocide, Mass Atrocities and Genocide Prevention, was one of our inspirations for starting the trust network so we have a lot to learn from the world and mm -hmm. we have a lot to learn from the communities in the united states who are responding in their own unique ways and i would say in order for this to be successful i would encourage all of you to find a way to be a part of this network um, there are processes that 
as Madhva said, we are engaging in regular trainings. We need this here because this is going to continue. This is not a short-term response and it's a community-based response. So we encourage all of you to join, continue to pay attention to the themes that are coming up during PeaceCon. And I am so glad we still have PeaceCon even in this context, it's as rich as it can be. Thank you to my colleagues and to all of the participants. Thank you everyone for going. There is a survey. Okay. There is a survey I believe that Ben is putting out there if people could complete as you leave. Thank you for participating. Thank you for engaging. Thank you AFP for giving us this space that we could have this conversation. And, and with that, may you all have an amazing day, evening, or tomorrow for those of you I got to meet that are up very, very late. Uh, thank you, everybody.